Hello and welcome to another virtual service of First Baptist Church of Decula. We are so very glad you decided to stop by our YouTube channel and join with us today for our worship service. Let me start with a question. What does complacency mean to you? Is it just fine? Should we be complacent in our lives in any area? What about spiritually? What about in our relationship with the Lord Jesus? Well, today our pastor is going to share a message from God's Word on just that topic. But as we do each week, would you please join with me as we lift our voices in praise to our God. Oh 
My soul in sad exile was out on my sea, so burdened with sin and distress, till I heard a sweet voice saying, Make me your choice, and I entered the haven of rest. I anchored my soul in the haven of rest. I'll sail the white seas no more. The tempest may sweep or the wild stormy deep. In Jesus I'm safe evermore. The song of my soul, since the Lord made me whole, has been the old story so blessed of Jesus who will save, who so begin this morning, I would like to express sincere appreciation to both David Mooney and Leah Mooney. Dave worked so hard developing and planning our music service. Leah as well takes part in our music, plus she spends hours over this COVID time editing and putting together the video that you are seeing this morning. A big thank you to Dave and to Leah. This morning, we're going to continue our study in the book of Colossians by looking at the, at the truth about Jesus, part two. All my life, I have used binoculars for one purpose or another. This pair is very good for spotting birds out in our trees and especially for looking at are hummingbirds. I have to keep the focus sharp, and if it gets out of focus, I just lose perspective on what I am trying to do. Same, when we lose perspective of our focus on the Lord Jesus Christ and who he is, complacency begins to set in. Complacency is a blight that saps energy, dulls attitudes, and causes a drain on the brain. There is no age limit or issue with complacency. It can comp come upon any of us. The first symptom of complacency 
is satisfaction with things as they are. The second is rejection of things as they might be. Good enough becomes today's watchword and tomorrow's standard. Complacency makes people fear the unknown, mistrust the untried, and abhor the new. Like water, complacent people follow the easiest course downhill. They draw false strength from looking back at the way things were. Remember this, Jesus will lift you out of the deepest pit, but will not lift you out of your recliner. <laughs> that is up to us. Question, are you a complacent person where the Lord is concerned? Have you been around church so long that Jesus no longer has an impact on your life? Do you spend time thinking about the good old days and have ceased being actively involved in what God is doing now? Would you rather sit by and let others be involved in the ministry while you just watch? Maybe it's time for you to refocus and to sharpen your vision about who the Lord is and what he wants to do with you this morning. Would you take your Bibles and look at Colossians chapter 1? And I'm going to read verse 19 through verse 23. Verse 19 begins, For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him, that's Jesus, and through him to reconcile everything to himself by making peace through the blood of his cross, whether things on earth or things in heaven. Now once you were alienated and hostile in your minds because of your evil actions, but now he has reconciled you by his physical body through his death to present you holy, faultless, and blameless before him. If indeed you remain grounded and steadfast in the faith and are not lifted away from the hope of the gospel that you heard. This gospel has been proclaimed in all creation under heaven, and I, Paul, have become a servant under it. To guard against complacency in our lives, we must be re-reminded that Jesus has supremacy over all things. We have seen this together in the first part of the chapter we're looking at now. The Bible reminds us that Jesus is the firstborn over all creation. And remember, firstborn does not uh, look at it in the sense of time, but rather in rank. Jesus is supreme. He is the firstborn over all creation. We're also reminded that Jesus is the image of God. He is the exact replica of God in all of his attributes. Thirdly, Jesus is the creator of all things. And our Bible says that all things hold together by Jesus' power. Atoms to orbits, gummy bears to galaxies, all were created and hold together by Jesus Christ. Fourthly, we have seen that Jesus is sovereign over the church. He is the head of of our local church. I am only the under shepherd. Jesus is the sovereign Lord. In fact, we sing a song like that. He is Lord. He is Lord. 
He is risen from the dead, and he is Lord. Every knee shall bow, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Now look with me, if you will, at verse 19. That verse says, For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him. All of God's fullness dwells in Jesus Christ. In fact, Jesus said to his disciples, If you have seen me, you have seen the Father. Now the word fullness is important. It is the Greek word pleroma. It comes from the Greek root pleroo, and it means absolute completeness. When I was in the Navy, and because of my lower rank, I was often chose to do menial tasks. One of them was to assist in loading the ship before we went out to sea. And huge pallets of everything that the, the crew would need was loaded upon the ship. Food stores by the tons was brought on for the 600 sailors as we went out to sea. All we needed to go out to sea was loaded on at that time. And we see in Christ that we are fully equipped for a successful trip. And all you need for a successful life is in Jesus Christ. And God fully abides in Jesus. Think about verse 20. Through Jesus, God is able to reconcile to himself all things. Now, reconciliation is the removal of hostility and the restoring of friendly relations to parties that have been at war. Now, humanly speaking, Forgiveness is one-sided. God commands me and enables me to forgive. But reconciliation takes both parties coming together. But biblically speaking, and in this passage, with God, reconciliation was totally one-sided. It was God that offered reconciliation to sinful man. Paul also calls reconciliation making peace through his blood shed on the cross. Now, people who are at odds with each other, whether in families or on the job or even in churches, they usually move away from each other they avoid, they ignore, they separate. And before the miracle of reconciliation, the Colossians and all unbelievers today were at odds with God. Look at verse 21. Once you were alienated and hostile in your minds because of your evil actions. Our Bible says before coming to faith in Christ, all of us were alienated. That is, we were separated. We were, we were estranged from God. We were alone. Because of our sin, we were an outsider. We were exiled. We were shut out. We were cut off. We were locked out of a relationship with God. And remember, dear ones, religion is never the issue. It is religion that teaches us that works are our way to get to heaven, to please God, to satisfy God's judgment. But the Bible says no. When a person trusts Christ as Savior, turning from his sin to God, it then becomes a relationship. And relationship is the issue that Paul is writing about here. Now, the following verses we're going to look at is why we, 
who have trusted Christ must share the good news with others. Would you look in your Bible at the book of Ephesians, another book written by the Apostle Paul, and we're looking at Ephesians chapter 2, verse 11 and 12. Verse 11 says, So then, remember that at one time you were Gentiles in the flesh, called the uncircumcised by those called the circumcised, which is done in the flesh by human hands. And Paul is looking back into the Old Testament, and he is saying that there was a time when those Colossians were cut off from the things of God. But look at verse 12. At that time, you were without the Messiah, excluded from the citizenship of Israel and foreigners to the covenants of the promise, without hope without God in the world. Paul is looking back at a time when under the law, circumcision of every male was required. It was an outward sign of allegiance to the God of the Old Testament. But we now do not have to look back and obey the law and outward rules because Jesus Christ came, and he earned through his blood reconciliation for all of us. Now, before salvation, there was a great chasm or gulf or separation between man on earth and God in heaven. And over the centuries, different attempts have been decided to be able to allow man to work his way and do good things to be able to bridge the gap and reach God. Some of those attempts are things like uh, joining a denomination or being, back or, uh, being baptized or also taking part in different religious ceremonies but none of those will bridge the gap and allow us to reach a holy God. It is Jesus' death on the cross, his burial and resurrection to pay for your sins that God has provided. Jesus' death allows God's enemy to become God's friend. Are you a, a friend of God? I mean, would God call you one of his friends? Paul tells us the condition that all of us were in at one time. He says that we were enemies, and he speaks about that in two different ways. First of all, we were enemies in our minds, our thoughts, our attitudes, they were hostile to God. We would be able to say back in that day, I can do what I want. I'm answerable to nobody. I want to fulfill my own desires and maybe even my own lusts. And before a believer trusted Christ, our entire way of thinking was contrary to God's way. In my life and in every other believer's life. For us, and for those who have yet to be reconciled to God, the problem was and is simple. We refuse to accept God's evaluation of us as being sinners. Oh, we can use uh, language and say that we're a sinner, but do we believe that down in our heart? We would also, in times past, not accept God's remedy for the situation that we find ourselves in. And God's remedy is a complete dependence on what Christ did on the cross for us. Yes, we were enemies, first of all, in our minds, 
But secondly, we see in the Bible, we were enemies in our deeds, in our actions, because of our evil behavior. Oh, it is not just that we thought wrong. It also was that we acted wrong. And our behavior was totally contrary to what God's word would have us to be. And despite our active opposition to God, our active involvement in the things of the flesh, God reconciled us, brought us to himself through the death of Jesus Christ. Jesus died for a tribe of ethnic rebels called humans to offer them a chance to become his allies, his friends. Look, if you will, in Colossians 1 at verse 21 through 23. Once you were alienated and hostile in your minds because of your evil actions, but now he has reconciled you by his physical body through his death to present you holy, faultless, and blameless before him. If indeed you remain grounded and steadfast in the faith and are not shifted away by the hope of the gospel that you heard, this gospel has been proclaimed in all creation under heaven. And I, Paul, have become a servant of it. You and I, as believers, and some who are listening that maybe have not trusted Christ yet, you are alienated. You are separated. You are estranged from our holy God, hostile in our thinking, our thoughts, our attitude, hostile towards God, even when we are our best and most religious. Without Christ, there is hostility in our thinking. Before we trusted Christ, our entire way of thinking was contrary to God's way. For us, <coughs> excuse me, and for those who have yet to be reconciled, the problem was and is simple. We refuse to accept God's evaluation. We are sinners. We are separated from God. We deserve eternal judgment. And But God was the one who reconciled. God's remedy for our dire situation is full dependence on the Lord Jesus Christ. And the outcome of this reconciliation is present peace and a current presentation of ourselves before God. Once a person trusts Christ as his Savior, then his responsibility, and yes, even desire, is to offer himself in daily practical ways to please him and to walk with him. Romans chapter 12, verse 1 and 2. Therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, I urge you to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this age, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may discern what is the good pleasing, and perfect will of God. You might need to say something like, Father, I know that I am a sinner, and I have sinned against you, and right now I believe that Jesus died on the cross for me, and I want to trust 
what Jesus did as all that I will ever need to have eternal life. And then once you become a believer, to be able to say to the Lord, I do not want to defile our relationship by being involved in sinful actions or sinful thoughts. I want right now to present myself to you as a living sacrifice. I do not want to be conformed to be about the way the world thinks or behaves, about the things that people are doing. I want to demonstrate by your grace that which is good and pleasing and perfect according to your will. Now, in any polarizing situation, the overriding sinful human tendency is to draw a line with oneself and one's allies on the good side and the opposing parties on the wicked side. Sounds like politics, doesn't it? Many times we draw lines and we gather our forces and we show that there's very little attempt to understand where the other side is coming from. As these positions harden, it becomes almost impossible to achieve the insight necessary for a breakdown in the hostilities. There's a term that we, we read called the line runs through. And this statement first was attributed to attributed to Vaclav Havel, the former president of the Czech Republic. You will remember that Havel was one of those who resisted the communists and was put into prison because of his activities. When Havel came to power after the Velvet Revolution, Havel was conspicuously forgiving towards his former enemies and others who collaborated against him. Some blamed him for this, but Havel maintained his position in the central European regimes of the 70s and 80s. And Havel said, the line between good and evil does not run clearly between them but in us, through each and every person. We need to choose to turn from sin and realize that the problems that we face are because of our attitudes and our perspective towards our God. To determine not to defile your relationship with the Lord, to be the kind of born-again believer whose behavior, whose words, whose thoughts show that you have been reconciled to God and there is a present peace and a future presentation of ourselves before God. The slate of your sin is wiped out at the moment you trust Jesus Christ as your Savior. And because of that wiping out of sin, you now have a relationship with Jesus Christ, never, ever, ever to be broken. And someday, when you stand before the Lord, Jesus will present you to his Father, holy in his sight, without blemish, and free from all accusation. We need to be sure that we're focusing on that which the Bible teaches. Because someday, believers will stand before God, and how wonderful when he will say to you, Well done, good and faithful servant. I love you. God bless you. 
I'm thankful that we are able to be together this way and we in the leadership are planning and working and, and looking at numbers because we want to be able to gather together. Thank you. You are a blessing to Patty and me. Praise God for the truth of his word. Would you pray with me today? We want to continue to remember those that we have been praying for recently, namely Carolyn Grover as she continues to recover from shoulder surgery. We also want to be in prayer for Jerry Smith as he continues to go through his cancer treatments. We want to be continuing in prayer for um, our frontline associates, specifically David Hernandez and his family, that the Lord would protect them and all of our medical professionals as well. We also want to be in prayer for Rick Gaudette and his family. We just learned this morning that Rick's mom went to be with the Lord this morning. So we need to pray for Rick and Bev as they work through those details as well. And then lastly, as you heard um, earlier as well, we're praying for our pastor's wife, Patty, as she prepares to go through knee replacement surgery this coming Friday. So please be in prayer for her, for her recovery, and for the doctors as they work on this very special lady. Would you pray with me today? Our Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for this day. We thank you for the privilege that we have to come before you in prayer. We do bring before you uh, special requests, thanking you that you are interested to hear what we would like to share. So we do pray, uh, as we have been, for Carol Lynn, continue to help her as she heals. We pray for Jerry as he continues to go through his uh, cancer treatments. We pray in a very special way for our frontline associates, David Hernandez and his family, please protect them. We also pray for Rick Goddett, Lord, in the passing of his mom. We're thankful that she is now in, in no pain and, and, and with you, and we praise you for that, but we do ask that you give them comfort during this time. And then we also pray for Patty, that you would be with her and help her, Lord, to be calm and assured that you have this and that the doctors will do their best work because we know, God, that you will be involved. We just pray for a speedy recovery and that things would go well. We also pray for one another that as we continue to look forward to that time where we'll be able to be together in person, that you would help the church leaders, our church leaders, to make the best decisions for the safety of our congregation, but also that would honor and glorify you. So we ask that you would be honored and glorified with everything we do, Father, for it's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. As I mentioned, as I prayed, we do hope that it will be soon when we get back together. And we are looking and watching and praying and working together as a leadership team to determine the best time to get back together. We hope that will be soon. And so as we sign off this week, I would say that this has been a ministry of First Baptist Church of Decula, 2534 Winder Highway in Decula, Georgia. And when we are back together in person, we hope that you will join with us. But for now, God bless you and your family and have a great day.